December 26, 2004, a day after Christmas. Tilly, a 10-year-old girl from the United Kingdom, is on a beach with her family. She immediately sensed that something was wrong. Her mother remembers the water on the beach swelling and coming in. A deadly tsunami triggered by a massive earthquake earlier that day off northern Sumatra was on its way. Her mother didn't know what was happening. She only noticed that the beach was getting smaller and smaller. Tilly, however, knew exactly what was happening. She was recalling a geography lesson her teacher gave two weeks ago, in which she learned about plate motions, earthquakes underwater, and tsunamis. She became hysterical, screaming at her parents to evacuate the beach. Alerted by her concerns, Tilly's father, along with many others, evacuated the beach and took refuge at the top floor of their hotel. The hotel was located further away from the beach, and that day it withstood the surge of three large tsunami waves. The exact death toll of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami is unknown, but more than a quarter of a million people lost their lives on this day. Millions were injured and even more displaced and became homeless. This event brought a shared destiny to both locals and those visiting from abroad. Germany alone lost more than 500 people who were vacationing as the tsunami waves reached the land. In a global sense, the level of earthquake hazards is low in Germany. Tsunamis also don't pose a real danger to Germany or even to the United Kingdom. It might seem like a waste of effort to learn about earthquakes and tsunami, but this seemingly irrelevant information can become potentially life-saving knowledge if it is shared effectively. It can help people like Tilly to treat their emotions logically and potentially change their destiny. Now, let's take a look at what happens when earthquake information is not shared effectively. Several years ago, my colleagues and I flew out to northern Pakistan as part of a scientific investigation to measure the post-earthquake motion associated with the 2005 Kashmir earthquake an earthquake that took the lives of more than 80,000 people. The scientific fieldwork brought us closer to those who had survived the earthquake. While drinking tea with earthquake survivors, it became clear to me that many of them did not know that their region was prone to earthquakes. Their scientific knowledge of earthquakes was close to zero. Many believed that it was God's will and that God's will and destiny choose who survives and which places get destroyed. There was even a disturbing campaign alleging that one of the reasons for the earthquake was women's sins, inappropriate behavior, and dress. Many women who managed to survive the earthquake quickly became victims of misinformation. This made me angry. But what inflamed me most was that it was not the lack of information that created a situation like this, but it was the lack of access to information. This realization came to me after talking to both locals and international scientists who were not surprised by the size or the location of the earthquake, and even some were expecting it. A year later, I found myself in a similar situation in Tajikistan. Soon after arrival, I learned that many of the locals had become so accustomed to the earthquakes that they could no longer feel them or react to them. One night, I was woken up by an earthquake. Everything around me was shaking. The next day, my neighbors told me that I was dreaming, but the seismometers proved them wrong. On the day of the earthquake, I spoke with a shopkeeper. He told me something that took me back to Pakistan. He said, there is nothing we can do about earthquakes, nothing. He even said that earthquakes are punishment for sins. Frustrated by this statement, I asked him if he thought earthquakes happen in Tajikistan. He said, yes. Then I said, 
then Tajikistan must be a very sinful country. He was confused. This conversation made me realize three things. First, I was upset. Second, I wanted to change his way of thinking. And third, I had no idea how to do it. Feeling vulnerable, I decided to go after those who are most vulnerable in times of disasters, children. They are the first who suffer from a lack of sanitation, infrastructure, and order following a disaster. Not knowing where to begin, I had no choice but to shut up and listen. So I asked them to teach me about earthquakes. So here's what a 14-year-old think about an earthquake. The earth is situated on the tips of a bull's horns. If the bull is irritated by flies or mosquitoes, he will swing his head and the earth will shake. Another girl told me that we live on a giant fish and every time the fish moves, the earth shakes and places get destroyed. These stories fascinated me, but they also worried me. In my small hotel room, I wondered how on earth one can go from thinking like this to thinking more like this, or even to thinking more like this. It quickly became clear to me that a simple definition of an earthquake was not going to do the trick. If I wanted them to understand earthquakes, I had to talk about plate motions. I had to talk about what's inside of the Earth. I had to talk about faults, elastic energy, friction, seismic waves. And what about earthquake hazards? Landslides, liquefaction, structural hazards, non-structural hazards. What about earthquake preparation and planning? Drills. The list grew tall. Together with what the kids taught me, I took all these concepts and turned them into earthquake science lessons. These lessons have been translated into eight languages, and over the last 10 years, my colleagues and I have used them to train hundreds of thousands of students, teachers, teacher trainers, school principals, and school safety officers globally. In Tajikistan, students are learning about earthquakes by building a simple model of a fault system using simple materials such as rubber bands, wooden blocks, and sandpaper. Geography teachers in China are using the same model, but they have added more complexity to it to make it more realistic to an actual earthquake. Teachers in Afghanistan are training other teachers about what faults are using pieces of cardboard how we have different faults produced by different types of plate motions and their relation to earthquakes. Teachers in India are teaching about the effects of liquefaction when a damaging earthquake happens, using a simple shake table, testing a model of a building that is built on an unconsolidated wet sand exposed to shaking. Students in Tajikistan are using the same shake table but they are testing different building models to understand how different structures behave and react to vibrations of different frequencies and to learn about resonance. In India, students are learning about structural elements and how they can be incorporated into their model wall in order to make it resistant to shaking. And in Tajikistan, teachers are learning about earthquake-induced landslides, how and why they occur, and what they can do to reduce hazards. The good news is that the earthquake education efforts are often not expensive, and they don't require any special high-tech equipment. With simple methods and easily obtainable material, scientists, teachers, can put together activities that are fun to play and also effective in communicating earthquake information. When I think about the shopkeeper who told me there is not much we can do, he is right that we cannot predict earthquakes, and maybe only God knows where and when the next ones are going to be. But earthquake damage can be minimized. After all, earthquakes don't kill people collapsed buildings, and their contents do. 
As scientists, we may be in a unique position to turn our scientific data into useful information for public. But many of those who have taken similar roles are ordinary people, people who are armed with information they take seriously. Mr. Yezepin is one of those heroes, and he's the hero of my next story. Many years before the devastating 2008 Sichuan earthquake in China, he became a school principal. Construction of an older classroom building worried him. It had been built without any standards. He could not ignore this problem. For many years, he struggled, but finally he was able to convince the government to upgrade the building. In May 12, 2008, the Sichuan earthquake occurred. Over 87,000 people were killed. Over 10,000 school children were buried under collapsed schools. But none of the 2,323 students belonging to Mr. Ye's school were among them. What is the first image that comes to your mind when you think about an earthquake? Is it a collapsed building, a damaged structure, people covered in dust and blood, or perhaps a mosquito-irritated bull, a giant fish? It may not be hard to demonize earthquakes, but the truth is earthquakes happen because our Earth is alive and it is in constant motion. Earthquakes are the pulse of our vibrant and dynamic planet. And there is hope for us to live in more harmony with earthquakes. I believe one way that helps us to live in more harmony with earthquakes and other natural hazards is by closing the information gap that exists between those who have access to information and those who don't. By doing so, we, as scientists, as data collectors, as teachers, educators, parents, we can begin to realistically hope that a loss of life on the scale of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, the 2005 Pakistan earthquake, and the 2008 China earthquake will not happen again. When I think about the Germans and thousands of others who faced their worst nightmare on December 2004, when the tsunami waves approached the land, I wonder if their fate would have turned out differently if there was a Tilly among them. Thank you. <laughs>